Hey guys, Merry Christmas. Uh, today is a very special day. Uh, it's the, uh, the birth of Jesus and we're celebrating that. And uh, as I was seeking um, what was on God's heart for us today, um, he led me to two sections of scripture that we're going to take a look at today. And uh, I want you to hold on for a second here. It's going to be a um, pretty wild ride. So uh, I'm going to start in John chapter 2, verse 13 through 16. And if you know your scriptures, you probably know this as... Um, uh, Jesus going in into the temple and cleansing the temple. Uh, but uh, hang in there because we're going to see how that correlates to uh, Jesus and today, Christmas. I, I've titled this message, uh, How to Stoke Out, actually, the birthday boy and uh, being Jesus, right? And so what's interesting about that, just recently, uh, I celebrated my son's 18th birthday. And uh, he just had it a few weeks ago. And I was thinking about like, man, there's a lot of buildup to uh, a birthday like that, right? There's a lot of uh, celebrating and, and, and preparation for the celebration. And, and you get all jazzed and, and stoked. And, uh, and so what's, what that reminded me of was this account where uh, Jesus is coming in to celebrate the Passover. And, uh, and just to give you a, a bit of a clue in of how these two things correlate, uh, the Passover itself was a festival that commemorated the Jewish deliverance from the bondage of Egypt. So they would celebrate in a, in a real big way because they, they had been under bondage for so many years. And so this was a huge festival for them. And in the same way, Christmas is a festival commemorating uh, the Christian's deliverance um, through the, uh, from bondage through the sending of Jesus. And so let's start in uh, John chapter 2, verse 13 uh, through 16, and we'll, we'll, I'll read it and then we'll go ahead and uh, talk about some of the points here. Uh, the Jewish Passover was near. And so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling ox, uh, sheep, and doves. And he also found money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and their oxen. He also poured out the money changers, coins, and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Now, I know you're probably thinking, Really? At Christmas, this is where you're going? But the truth is, is... Um, we want to look at what, if this is his birthday, what's not going to stoke him out, right? And in this case, why is he bent? Why is he so out of shape, right? We got to take a look at that. And so it wasn't, I want to make this distinction. It wasn't an impulsive moment either. You notice that it said that he, he uh, made a cord, a whip, out of cords that literally you would, you know how long it would take to sit there and weave a whip? I mean, he thought through this. Something was burning within him. And so let's think about this. Just as we get excited for Christmas, right? He would have been, Jesus would have been excited to come see at the temple people celebrating freedom from bondage. What did he see though? The temple was supposed to be a place of worship where you bring your best unblemished animal and sacrifice it to God for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, to get a, a real understanding as to why he's so bent, we need to look at, uh, for a second, um, what the temple was all about. You see, he gave instructions on how to build the temple. And so we want to understand what he was seeing and what he should have seen. So, in the very uh, core of it was the Holy of Holies. And that's where uh, it was a, a room that only God's presence would appear there. Nobody was to enter. This was where God appeared. And then just outside of that was the holy place. It was the place where only the priests would go to meet with God. Then outside of that would be 
the court of the priests. Now, that's the outer section where they're starting to do sacrifices. This is where people would visually see uh, the uh, Aaronic priesthood actually making the sacrifice. And this would be where people were um, visually seeing uh, the transformation or the transfer transference, I should say, of the sin of man to the animal, right? Or the imagery of it. Outside that, just along this long stretch of wall was a, uh, a place called the Court of Israel. And in the Court of Israel, uh, this was only for a place for men only. And what it would have had, what you would have seen was uh, the priest, Aaronic priesthood, would have set up instruments in that section, and they would be playing music and worshiping or, or singing uh, two praises to God. There also would be 12, uh, twi the 12 tribes of Israel, there would be representatives there that were watching the sacrifices going on and also uh, praying as well. Now, outside of that, would be the court of the women. Uh, women would be able to go in that section and worship God. Now, most importantly, on the outer perimeter of the whole thing, let's say as you walked up to the temple, as you walked up to, let's say, a modern day church, what you would see in this case, in the temple, was what was called the court of the Gentiles. Now, why is that important? The court of the Gentiles was a place for non-believers People were maybe seeking, what, what's this God all about? Um, that's where they would come up and they were allowed to go. Okay, so they would come up into the back uh, or to the, to the uh, sorry, to the outer perimeters and they would be looking in and seeing what's this God and his people all about. If you were curious, that's where you could go. If you were a non-Jew, a non-believer. It'd be the same as like for today. Let's say uh, a person that kind of, and I know I did this early on in my uh, relationship with God. I would walk into a church. I'd sit in the very back. I don't want anything to do with going way up in there, mixing up, you know, with the people at all. I want to sit in the back and see what this is all about first. And so that's kind of the same mindset. Now, what did he see where people should be able to come and, and see what it represents God and his people and the relationship. Uh, instead of seeing worship, it says that he finds his people had made it into a marketplace, a market, a business. This would have been like us today, setting up programs in church designed to make money um, to keep it going. Right. For example, and I know this is maybe a stretch, but um, let's say a, a, someone seeking God wants to come into a church today and they wanted to roll in and kind of just sit in the back and see what it's all about. But as they walked in, they had their cup of coffee, their Starbucks, whatever, Pete's coffee. All of a sudden, someone says, hey, nope, sorry, you can't bring that coffee in. That's not allowed. You got to throw that one in the trash right there. But don't worry, we sell a special blend of Jesus coffee. And what we have is $10 a cup. When your $5 cup wasn't good enough. You see, they made it, his people made it into a mall. Into a business. And that broke his heart. And I would say, by his actions, pissed him off. Why do we say that? Because it misrepresented God, completely misrepresented God and what he was about and what his people were to be about. So what was his response? He cleared the room. Get this crap out of here. Stop turning my house, my father's house into a market. You know, there's another time where he did this and only in this other account, he actually says, my father's house is to be a house of prayer, a place of worship, crying out to the father and asking for deliverance, for forgiveness, interceding on other people's behalf. 
Jesus was bent because the temple was to be a place where non-worshippers, non-believers could come and see what it was all about. But instead they filled it with the ways of the world. And that's not what he's all about. We're supposed to be different than the world. This misrepresented God to all of mankind. We're to look different than the world. Now, let's transition for a moment. That's the image of the temple and what people would see and why he was upset. So let's see, how can we stoke out the birthday boy? That tells us how not to, right? Well, now we know the Bible says that uh, the temple has been done away with and that the new temple is our body. He says that our body is the new temple and it's uh, set up in a way that he says, I, I literally put my presence in you, the Holy Spirit. So just as the court of the Gentiles was a place for non-believers to see uh, God and, and or what God was about and his people were about, so now is your and my life. The way we live, the things we value, the way we worship. What are non-believers seeing when they look at us as the temple carrying around his presence? Now, while you think about that, I want to take a look at the contrast um, in this, well, not a contrast, but an interaction between Jesus and one of the rulers of the Jews. Someone watched all this happen. One of the rulers of the Jews, they watched all this happen. And no doubt, he was a ruler of the Jews. So guess what? He probably had something to do with setting up this um, this mess, this market that upset Jesus. But even though he had done that, we see in this interaction that there's some conviction going on. As a matter of fact, his name's Nicodemus. It's in John 3, 14 through 21 that we're going to take a look at. And Nicodemus recognizes Jesus as being from God. He literally says, hey, uh, nobody could do the signs and wonders that, they do, that you're doing unless they're from God. So I recognize that you must be legit. Then they go back and forth as to what it means to be uh, born again. He's a little confused. He's not sure. He's only known this old way of doing things. And he's trying to understand uh, what is this thing he's talking about being born again. But Jesus goes straight to the point just after this. And we start in John 3, 14. And many of you probably know John 3, 16. But let's start in 14. It says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness... So the Son of Man must be lift up, lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And this is John 3.16, which probably everybody knows. For God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, I want you to notice something here. Yes, we make Christmas all about Jesus, right? And I'm all about Jesus. But there's often this theology that we carry from maybe uh, a bad upbringing or a bad uh father experience and that's we we think of jesus as the new testament loving god and and then the father god as this uh, old testament wrathful god but notice in in in, in john three sixteen it says for god loved the world in this way for the father god loved the world in this way that he gave his one and only son he loved us so much that he gave his best. 
One might say he's actually the best gift giver at Christmas. He was the one who gave his son to us. And why? It says, so that you will not perish, but have eternal life. Eternal life. That's his desire. He loves you so much that he gave his one and only son at Christmas, born in a manger, to live a, a perfect, righteous life, to transfer his righteousness to you, and that he would bear your sin and my sin. He's the one and only final sacrifice that was ever needed. No longer do we have to bring animals to sacrifice on our behalf. Jesus bore it all on the cross. We see that the Father and the Son's heart in this are loving towards a people who needed redemption. And notice he said that God did not send his Son into the world to condemn us but to save us through him. Now, John spends a lot of his book contrasting dark and light, darkness and light. We're going to see in this section, it's going to be darkness and light contrasted and the condemned and the non-condemned. In verse 18, and I want you to notice in this section that it's connected to our life choices and our pursuits in life. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. You don't go to hell for sin. Like I said, and it showed, Jesus paid the price for sin. As a matter of fact, in 1 John, it says that he paid the sin for paid the price of sin for the whole world, which means everybody. He paid for it all. So we actually are condemned because he says he has not believed in the name of Jesus. <clears throat> now he goes on and he says, This is the judgment in verse 19. That the light has come into the world. And people loved darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. Now, I want to be absolutely clear here. It says that um, that you the people loved darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. This denotes a deliberate pursuit of sin or what God calls or sees as evil. You see a choice. Here's my ways. My deeds are evil. My my life is not healthy. I'm, I'm pursuing these things that are, that are what God sees as evil. And then I have this other choice to follow this uh, Jesus that actually leads me to light and to truth. And that he'll, he has a whole nother plan for my life. And he says, these people deliberately choose this direction. Now, let's be clear here. We're not talking about people who fall into temptation. We all sin. We are all sinners. But those that choose light when they sin, those that choose to follow Jesus and, and then slip up and, and find themselves back in their old ways for a moment. But, but then when you do it, you, you have this like, broken heart, like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. It's, I hate that I did that. That is not what we're talking about here. 
We're talking about someone that chooses that path and says, I'm going this way regardless. So the key is deliberate. He says in verse 20 that for everyone who does evil, hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds might not be exposed. Those people that are choosing that path of, of uh, darkness or, or evil, they often uh, don't want to be around light. They don't want to be exposed. So maybe you've had this experience. Maybe you know someone that... Um, you used to be buds with and man, we used to hang out and we were cool. And, and then all of a sudden uh, they don't want to be around you anymore because your presence, or maybe better said the presence of the Holy spirit in you makes them uncomfortable because they're feeling exposed for what they want to do or what they do. You bring a sense of conviction to them and it's easier for them to stay away simply because of your choices of pursuing the light. This is a time in, the, in Christmas that we reflect on relationships and friendships and some, it, it brings, you know, super joyous heart moments. And then there's some that um, I know that have wayward kids or, or various things like that. Broken relationships where they're bummed about that. I want to remind you, that Jesus said, my house shall be a house of prayer. We can cry out to the one who can reach anyone at any time, anywhere. And he hears us. And he can reach them. He says in, in verse 21 going on, but anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. Notice it says lives by the truth, right? Someone who practices, someone who is a learner uh, of truth. What do I mean by truth? Knowing what's right. You know, God has written us his scripture and his Holy Spirit to dwell within us so that we can spend time with him and actually get to know what is on his heart, what is right for us. Some people call that uh, Christian values, but um, we follow in a personal relationship with Jesus and he leads us to new ways of living. I call that uh, becoming an apprentice of the way of Jesus. And how do we do that? We allow the Holy Spirit access to every part of our life. We get up in the morning or in the afternoon, whenever you do it, I just find for myself it's easier in the morning because I don't want people to meet with me until I've met with him and been changed and transformed by him. And and literally, we, we get up and cry out like David maybe, search my heart and know me, see if there's any wicked way in me. Turn the tables over in my life, Lord, and let me know where I've set up idols and where I've uh, made things in my life that are not pleasing to you. And then listen, let him speak to you. Sometimes it'll be through the word of God, where literally we spend time in the word of God, not just to know the word of God, but to spend time with the God of the word. Literally to spend time with him. So why the two different sections of scripture? I think that Christmas is a perfect time to remember that this life is, pulls us in every direction, especially, it seems, at this time of season. I just came from the store, and my goodness, it was chaos. Couldn't even think straight in there. So we see in that temple account in the beginning what Jesus doesn't want us to do with our life. We're to be different than the world. We're to set up our temple in a way that pleases him, that reflects to people as they uh, come to see what this life is all about, what a Christian is all about. We set up our temple in a way that pleases him and honors him and shows people worship. We're to stoke out the, the birthday boy, so to speak. Put on display 
why he came as a baby and lived a, a sinless life and and then took on um, our sins so that he could sacrifice once and for all for us. Then we look clearly at the gospel again. In Jesus' conversation with Nick, right? Someone who was seeking the way, trying to figure Christianity out, so to speak. You see how we're to get right to the point, not only by living in a way that reflects him, but share how God loves and how he uh, sacrificed for them. To put on display why he came. Then we look clearly at um, the last part. Hopefully a gentle reminder of what it looks like to run away from God, to seek out darkness rather than light, to, to pursue and say, I want this rather than your way, God. But also to see what it looks like to follow well, to be a temple shining so that God can reveal his love through your life and my life. I want to pray for us as we end here and uh, just close out with asking God to be with all of us and to transform us more into his image, to cleanse the things out that don't please him. So, Father, I pray that you would remind us of how you want our temples to look and how you don't want them to look. And how, Lord, there are people watching. Lord, you've made a place in life for people to come and view and see what our uh, Christianity, our life is to be all about, our pursuit of you, Lord. I pray that we would give you access to cleanse out the areas that are not pleasing. Lord, I pray that you would help us to walk in a way to, to be a learner, to be a pursuer of the things of you, to look different than this world so that we could put on display why you came over 2,000 years ago as a baby on Christmas. Thank you, Lord, for coming. Thank you, Lord, for your heart towards us. Father, thank you for sending the best gift you could have ever given to any person in this world, your one and only son, in Jesus' name, amen. See you guys next week. Um, by the way, we are uh, looking at a building tomorrow, and uh, we, we really do covet your prayers at, uh, about basically the next step for uh, planting a church And so uh, in Lake Stevens. We love you. Thank you guys. Talk to you soon.